the uh, Charlestown Utility Board special meeting here Thursday, February 21st, 4 p.m. So thank you all for joining us on this, uh, for this special meeting. Um, all right, first item of business is public comment. This portion of the agenda is designed for members of the general public to share thoughts on items of interest in the community. By law, board members may ask clarifying questions or discuss procedural matters, but are not permitted to discuss the policy merits of any issue unless it is scheduled for discussion. So it looks like we have two, six speakers. So uh, if you'll each limit yourselves to three minutes. First up, Jay Mansfield. Hello everyone, I hope the snow hasn't gotten you down. Um, my name is Jay Mansfield, I'm from Shepherdstown. This county is the place where bad ideas come to die. It's a place where bad ideas like slavery came to die. It's going to be the place where bad ideas like heavy pollution has come to die. Heavy pollution is not mandatory. Heavy pollution is allowed and enabled by a government agency called the Environmental Protection Agency. They make it legal for companies to pollute. That's their job. That's why Richard Nixon put it together around back in the day, the 60s and 70s, when all the hippies were raising cane. Well, I was only 12 then, but I was raising cane anyway. And it's just wrong for this county. There's no question that it was just a mistake Everybody thought that the EPA was the one that was going to determine that it was safe. And now they're embarrassed by that and their pride's on the line. There's a lot of people that wish they hadn't made that decision to let them here. Some of them just bailed out <coughs> at the JCDA. Of course, maybe that's because I was making fun of them, like they were Gomer Pyle or something. But um, the truth is, the biggest problem we have here is that people don't understand time. They don't understand the impact of relative length of exposure that these kids will have. It's, you know, it, they go around and they go to these towns and they ask them, how, you know, how have you dealt with rock wool? And they say, oh, we like it, we like it. But they haven't asked anyone who's been there 12 years. These kids are gonna be exposed for 12 years. And if you say it's safe, well, that's kind of like saying, walking down the street and asking somebody in Milton, Ontario, who's smoking a cigarette, if they have cancer. And if they don't have cancer, it's safe. But we all know that it's the exposure time to smoke that eventually causes cancer. And when Eric Lewis went up to Milton and was up there and evaluated um, his feeling for whether or not Milton was okay, he had a sampling error of 99.9%, .9%. okay? When you do sampling, there's a specific set of scientific rules that you follow to make sure that your sample is not biased and that it's accurate and reproducible. He didn't bother to do that. And uh, it's because he didn't know. He just thought if people were okay with it, people would be okay with it. He didn't ask the question of safety. Great, thank, thank you for, you your, for time. your time. Next up is uh, Christine Marshall and then Juliana Brogna. Hi, um, <clears throat> I was wanted to ask the question, how does a utility determine appropriate capacity? A friend has been um, examining CTUB's flow data and has shared it with me. In 2018, average flow was 1.5 million gallons per day. Peak flow was 2.5 million gallons per day. On average, CTUB's peak exceeded capacity by 40%. Month by month, many 2018 months had a peak flow of two to four million gallons per day, which is hugely over capacity. If 2018 flows routinely exceed or ex approach capacity, should not the utility be sure by um, 
by shouldn't the utility be sure while Guol provides accurate numbers to the utility? Should CTUB upgrade its POTW before agreeing to accept more waste, especially if the sewer user has not provided accurate discharge numbers? Um, we know that Rockwell has provided um, in the Deloitte letter in 2017 and in the sewer shed study that was provided by Hatch Chester to uh, Ranson that they needed 40,000 gallons per day for industrial use. And, um, and yet, CTUB, Ms. Arnett, and Ms. Stolifer is, is only requesting 14,900 gallons per day in its MPDES uh, permit modification. So with the flows being over capacity to the POTW, it seems like it's, you're more ready to go the route of um, requesting a moratorium on, on your POTW instead of um, increasing capacity of the sewer lines um, to increase the flows to a POTW that does not have capacity. Um, I, I, I think there should be a discussion by the utility to, with the public to determine what appropriate capacity is. And how, how does it determine appropriate capacity before it, it determines a moratorium is in order? Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Juliana Brogna and then Tim Ross. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Juliana Branya. I'm a resident of Kearneysville. Some of you have already heard these comments, so excuse me for repeating myself. I would like to bring to your attention a troubling lack of transparency from the Charlestown Utility Board staff that has affected the public's right to know and understand the details of the proposed Route 9 sewer project. On December 7th, a FOIA request was submitted to CTUB on behalf of Jefferson County Vision. Last week, I followed up on this FOIA on behalf of JCV as CTUB had acknowledged the request but had not delivered the information. CTUB has not responded to my follow-up, but I did receive a voicemail from CTUB's attorney asking for the bar number of the West Virginia lawyer under whom I'm working. As you may know, a FOIA has no requirement that it be submitted by a lawyer, much less a West Virginia lawyer. The attorney's request therefore seems to be intended to further delay and chill questions re related to this FOIA and the Route 9 sewer project in general. <clears throat> As a result of the lack of a response, the citizens of Jefferson County cannot do the, dil the due diligence that we demand. We have a right to know, and we will use the information to inform you, our elected officials, or our CTUB board, and we'll share it with the community. This is what our FOIA request is for, to provide information to the public so that they can know what the government is doing. I call on the CTUB board to assist us in our efforts to provide the citizens of Jefferson County with a full picture of the Route 9 sewer project. I ask you to do what you can to compel the CTUB staff to stop delaying and respond fully to our FOIA request. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tim Ross and then Jackie Milliron. Hey, I'm Tim Ross, Charles and I just live in the county and um, appreciate the opportunity to speak here. And a couple of you may have already heard what I want to talk about, but I um, just want to let you know that at least I do understand that when we talk about CTUB, we have staff of the utility, we have volunteers from the community, we have appointed people, but you all kind of get lumped under CTUB, right? But there's times I feel that part of CTUB doesn't exactly know everything that's going on, and that that troubles me a bit. I've seen things come out with CTUB's name on it that I'm not exactly sure that everybody in CTUB is, is aware of it. Um, kind of goes to, to the uh, question about capacity, but I saw a letter January 9th from Ms. Arnett to the DEP replying to uh, notice of violations, and um, let's see, she says CTUB further asserts that it expects future rainfall conditions to return to normal 
and the likelihood will be that collection system flows will return to normal. So I don't know if you all were part of that letter, the drafting of the letter, the environmental lawyer cleared off on it. I'm a meteorologist. That's what I did for 40 years. I would never come out and say something like that, okay? Climatologists can do that. Climate.gov can do that. And that's what the, the little document there with the picture of the hurricane on the front, all right? This is what climate.gov says that the weather is going to be for the rest of the year. And it says a, a high chance of high probability that we are going to be hotter than normal and that we are going to be wetter than normal, okay? So <clears throat> that data is out there, all right? So we're out here. We can do research. The government's providing research. You can go and look and get it. And to think that we're going to go back to normal, climate change science says, hey, it's going to be wetter. There's going to be more intense precipitation events. 2016, the southern part of the state got inundated, all right? There was 12 counties declared disaster areas. 2017, the north central part of the state got hammered. Four more were added as disaster areas. Last year, it was our turn, right? And there was eight more counties. In the last three years, 43% of the counties in West Virginia have been declared, presidentially declared disaster areas because of, of weather, okay? So when you're thinking about capacity, when you think about normals, I can tell you there's no such thing as a normal day. When was the last time any of you had a normal day, whatever the heck that is, all right? You add the numbers up over 30 years and you get an average and you call normal. Duke's laughing, he goes, yeah, I think it was 1959, right? Okay, so um, I'm asking you to inform yourselves. If you're gonna make, if you're going to make a, a decision based upon science, then use good science. The resource is out there. Jay, he's a chemical engineer. I'm a meteorologist. We've got microbiologists. We've got everything you need. But please, if you, members of CTOB, if things are going out with your name on it, I would be concerned. Hey, do I believe this? Did I clear off on this? Did I sign this? Okay? <coughs> we have questions about numbers CTOB is using. All right? This is one of the numbers. Thank you very much for your Thank time. Thank you. Jackie Milliron and then Kathy Jowski. Joust Joust. Sorry about that. Good afternoon. Um, I want to talk about two things. Um, one is credibility through transparency. Um, I've been doing this a very long time, working with utilities and, and I guess not working with utilities. Um, and what I have noticed is that if you're not transparent, um, there, there, you don't gain any credibility through that. Um, in the last year at the PSD, um, the newest PSD, uh, former PSD board members um, made everything um, available on projection on the wall. Everything they were looking at minus executive session items. We were able to see, I was able to get up close and personal to the data and uh, those were available online. Um, and and it, it, it gets rid of all the questions and I think it'll help build credibility if that's what you're interested in. If you're not interested in that, then I don't know. But I do know that having been at the PSD, uh, you acquired with the merger or the consolidation two very, very good people who know how to make things transparent and that would be Ashley and April. Um, they were very good at uh, g giving information. I emailed them. They had the response right away. And so I understand that now we are over probably 7,000 customers and it's probably impossible to do that. But um, just being transparent is really, really important um, for your customers. We are the right payers. We are the ones that pay the bills. And we know we are providing a service, but there it is. The second thing I wanted to talk about is a PSD, the former PSD project. I went to the town council meeting and noted that there were some concerns uh, of options. And one of the things I want to make sure you know is that the PSD project 
the $7 million one, was stipulated as economic growth. And for the life of me, I do not know why the state did not give money for that if it was economic growth. Why they lay, laid that burden on the ratepayers, I don't know. Because most of that project, if not all, was for economic growth. And they even had a press release about that. It was in their docket about that. So I guess what I'm asking is, you, is to you, for you to review those options with the town council and to look at the PSD project and see if there can be some tailoring to help use the money wisely that the state is giving, if that's possible. Um, because both projects were for economic growth. The maintenance issues within the PSD project have been by and large taken care of. There are a couple of items, but not, not a, like a panel or two for p two pump stations. Um, so I'm just asking you for, for you to review those options with the town council. Um, they seem to be struggling with that, um, but uh, I really think that those two projects can be blended together and um, to spare the rate payers the cost of this economic growth. Great, thank you. <laughs> and final speaker is Kathy. All right, my apologies, because <coughs> some of you have heard this before too. But it appears to us that CTUB is knowingly providing false information, inaccurate information in the pending wastewater permit modification application. In this modification, CTUB is requesting permission to handle a maximum flow of 14,900 gallons per day. But the Hatch-Chester engineering analysis from January 22, 2018 states that Rockwell expects to discharge 40,000 gallons per day uh, beginning in 2019. And in correspondence with CTUB in January uh, 24th and February 5th of this year, Rockwell itself explained that their capacity needs are actually 46,800 gallons per day for the first phase of Rockwell Ranson. These numbers are over three times greater than the discharge limit in the pending permit modification. Let me repeat, Rockwell expects to produce three times the amount of waste flow that CTUB is providing to the DEP currently. At the Charlestown City Council sewer bond workshop, Ms. Stolifer told the City Council that CTUB intends to use a phased approach to environmental approvals for Rockwell's industrial waste. But 46,800 gallons per day is the phased approach. That is Rockwell's phase one. 46,800 is not the final number for all possible expansions. Ultimately, Hatch Chester says Rockwell will produce up to 100,000 gallons per day within the next 10 years. Providing less than accurate information to environmental regulators is unethical. It's contrary to DEP's permit requirements. DEP's permitting standard conditions section 1.10 requires that when a permittee becomes aware that they have submitted incorrect information, he or she shall promptly submit omitted slash corrected facts or information. Perhaps even more importantly, CTUB is violating the fiduciary responsibility to ratepayers and the system in two different ways. First, CTUB, not Rockwell, bears the cost and penalty for violations if Rockwell exceeds the 14,900 gallons per day. Please note that Rockwell has already committed six DEP viol water violations at the Jefferson Orchard site and they haven't even started construction. Second, if CTUB has a problem attaining the major modification, they need to know that now before construction is started. If there is a DEP permitting issue, it needs to be uncovered now while plans can change and, cons and state construction funding is available. It would be much more expensive to retrofit the system after it's built. It is common sense that CTUB should obtain the permit for Rockwell's phase one, 48,000 gallons, 100,000 gallons before they even start construction. What CTUB is doing isn't phasing based on Rockwell's projections. It is gaming the permitting process to avoid a major modification <coughs> in order to rush construction of this sewer line. In so doing, CTUB is transferring risk to the system and to the ratepayers. That's a political calculation, and it's contrary to CTUB's duty to ratepayers and the public interest. Why isn't CTUB using the Hatch Chester engineering numbers? Why aren't they using Rockwell's data provided in the last two months? There's absolutely no reason for CTUB to proceed with inaccurate numbers and estimates to the DE DEP. This board should demand that the current permit modification application with the DEP be revised to accurately reflect Rockwell's phase one waste flow. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you. <coughs> All right. That ends the uh, public <coughs> comment portion of the agenda. We'll now move into the utility manager report. Yeah, before I turn it over, just one comment um, on one of the, uh, the public commenters mentioned um, something that reminded me. If you don't know, the city council has scheduled a special workshop where we'll be talking about the options that are included in the, um, this engineering report that's been referenced a couple of times. So if you're able to attend that meeting or listen in, please do so. That will be Wednesday night, <coughs> um, the 27th at 6 p.m. Okay, so with that, Jane, if you wanna turn your screen off. Okay, it's 6 p.m. Yep. All right, so first order of business, engineering services agreement, Hatch Chester. I believe this is a carryover from last meeting, so everything is in order um, as Hoy indicated. Um, <clears throat> it's just sort of a clarification of item A, 2A, and item 2B there. So at the last meeting, just to uh, bring folks up to speed, I think this is the, um, the 5G process that uh, Pete and I participated in, in terms of the, and Kristen had participated in, in terms of identifying qualified applicants. Um, we had identified Hatch Chester as one of those, and basically we now need to execute the, 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 um, the agreement with them. So is there a motion to approve the agreement? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any additional discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed nays. Any abstentions? Motion approved. All right. So that's the agreement itself. Next item then is task order number one. Hatch Chester. So um, yes, task order number one is the response to the Rock Wool Mainline 5.5 request, which obligates us to prepare a cost estimate for what they have requested for their full build out um, of, I, I don't have the whole letter with me, but this, this estimate will basically provide the design for their 46,800 roughly, um, build out and then we will present that back to them. So this is the letter that was included in the last packet, correct, last week? That mm -hmm. was dated February the 7th? Yes. Okay. I think. Is that, was my number correct? I don't that have was that the task, It I'm, was I'm task order number one with a $6,000 oh, yes. mm -hmm. $6, estimate. Yes, correct. yes. So one of the questions that came up in the public comment section is that, um, you know, maybe it looks like it might be more like 100000 or at least that's the number that was in the engineering study. How do you respond to that? I recognize that's not in Hatch, or that's not in Rockwell's letter. Rockwell says basically they're going to use 44,000 plus and design it to that level. Sure. So I think, you know, based on um, the initial uh, Deloitte request and the premise for Hatch Chester moving forward, the um, design had not been refined, even from Rockwell, um, and their initial estimates were higher uh, to the magnitude of maybe 80,000 to 100,000 gallons per day. And as they have refined their processes, their equipment, they have drilled down to their anticipated usage. Mm -hmm. um, they have confirmed, uh, sent a response letter to us based on the letter we sent out with regard to the phase one flow of 14,900 gallons, they have confirmed that as their phase one flow. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, I believe we have presented that to city council uh, previously with regard to their anticipated build out phase one, phase two, and possibly an intermediate phase of their processes. Right. Right. And in this letter, the task order, it talks about basically going, basically they'll be costing out what it is to provide rock wool only service, no other users on the line. Um, and it references a single pump station. I know there's been a lot of discussion about two and three pump stations. So they only need one. I, that's at least what they're thinking here. And is that one of the options that you would see in this old Hatch Chester report or is that 
was that not really one of the options back then? It's yes, there were option one was a rock wool only mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. um, they have a pump station on a private pump station on their site. Uh, so I would have to go back and look to see if that was anticipated, if there would need to be modifications. I mean, they're in design or they have that pump station designed separate from the Route 9 sewer project. So they will have Chester will take a look at what would need to be done to either the pump station on their site or a, another pump station that would be able to transfer the flows from Jefferson Orchard's property to the point yep. of interconnection yep. with our system. Yep. And I think the letter talks about following the, the route, though, the same route. Basically, we're going to use the same easements that have been secured at this point, so we don't anticipate a change in the direction. I think that would make the, the most direction. sense, certainly, um, to utilize what we have in the current design with any alternatives. And if my memory is correct, um, the early estimate was $9 million-ish. For the total, total construction cost. That would include all of the design, construction, um, so yes, I think that was right about So that they'll be way. reworking that number. Yes. Yeah. And that's, yeah, and in order to be responsive then to the original request from Rockwell, that's the reason for the task order. Other questions from, from members? Keep in mind their 5-5 request from January 24th is for 27,550 gallons. Um, we have since had correspondence to them acknowledging that this first phase of construction, one, phase one, um, I think there's a 1B, 1A, 1B and two, um, they've not asked for 1B and, and two. Mm -hmm. However, they've acknowledged in their last letter that you know, they would like us to consider the total of the 46,000, which would be one, 1B and two, um, but they have given no timeline on even the building construction starts on 1B or 2, mm -hmm. which again makes this um, <coughs> specific engineering evaluation of more concern because you'll have to treat 27,550 for potentially five to 10 years. I don't know, maybe you know, their build out schedule for 1B and 2, but, but then you know, you'll kind of double that, but right. you've got very low flows for a number of years um, before they're yeah. built out at, at whatever year that is. Right, and so we don't, we, sorry, we don't know then <clears throat> when those next phases possibly gonna be happening. 2025, they should be built down. Well, they had indicated when we spoke with them early on in the process of submitting the NPDES application mm -hmm. that phase 1B could be within a two to four or five year time frame, but they would not even give us a, a schedule of phase two, which would be the mirror image of phase one of the 14,900 gallons, um, which certainly would not, I mean, DEP would not include those future flows in a permit, an NPDES permit modification with the unknown characteristics of, of those future flows. So if that is the purpose and the basis for <coughs> submitting the minor modification for the phase one flows, which are known. And that, that's what's currently down at DEP now, the 14? Yes. Yes. Phase one, correct? Yes. And if they want to go over 14.9 then, right, that's a new modification request. Once, that, once they go over 14.9. Yeah, yes. if, and, and again, if that's five years out, our, our permit is renewed every five years. We wouldn't, yeah. <coughs> we wouldn't consider something five years out because it's past even our permit authorization date. Having, a, having um, this as a minor versus a, 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 a major, so next time, eventually, when phase two is begun and they, well, they begin to plan for phase two, um, they would have to request another modification. Does that include the original 14.9 then? Becomes a major modification at that point. Mm -hmm. At, at, at tw one 25,000. 25,000 gallons per day. Okay, so that second, that's what I thought. It's sort of an cumulative effect, right? Yes. <laughs> so that second modification then is no longer a minor. It's not that you can have two minors. The second one then automatically becomes a major, assuming it's, it hits the 25 mark from the beginning of their day one of their operations, yes. correct? Total combined, the trigger's 25,500, is that right? 25,000. 25, 
Right. The trigger would be 25 if 14 was the first one when it got to 25, whether it was 26, it would become a major. That's so that's how the way they'd have to present it, and it has to be accepted or denied. Okay. And I think at the last meeting we talked about this maybe a couple of two to three week process for them to come back with a revision. As I was looking through the letter again one more time, it looks like there is sort of an intermediate step. They'll provide a 30 to 50 percent estimate back. It says back to CTUB. I'm assuming that's staff kind of do a preliminary look at what they've got and then provide some response to them and help, I don't know, facilitate the final estimate. Sure. Yes, I think that's the that it would be the goal to make sure that we're both on the same page with the um, the approach. Yep. That's consistent with any other. That's consistent with any other project. You'll see that come forward with the 2021 renewal and replacement project at 30 percent, just so that they are sure they're understanding what our. Yep. You know, moving forward is what that picture looks like. What the project looks like. Great. Yeah, currently, our permit's got industrial users on it anyway, so yes. we already have some loading in that capacity anyway. Okay. All right, so um, if there aren't any other questions, is there a motion to approve the task order? So moved. And a second, moved and seconded. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nays. Any abstentions? Motion approved. Uh, next item on the agenda is the Route 9 sewer project statement. So uh, as I had said at the last meeting, my job is to carry out whatever city council asked me to do. So um, if it's the will of the utility board uh, to talk about it, I think I'll step out, recuse myself from the conversation itself. Um, if there was some question about whether tonight would be the only opportunity or whether we plan on meeting on the 27th. Do, you, do we know if we need to meet next week or not? Um, we certainly would prob would need a meeting for additional invoices that come in at the end of the month. Right. Um, so I don't have a problem if we have a quick meeting, but that's on the, that's the next item on the agenda. Yeah. So maybe they could be yeah. considered jointly as to whether formal statement needs to be adopted at the next. So, and that's I guess that's the point. I mean, if we feel like there's going to be one more meeting. Then, uh, then I won't step out of the room because we'll we'll take it up on the agenda for the next meeting. But if we if we're not certain there's going to be another meeting, I'll, I'll step out now, and you guys can talk about it and come back and let's go to D before we determine what we're going to talk about on C. Okay. okay. All right. So let's talk about whether or not we're going to need a meeting next week. Um, so we know we'll have some bills for approval. Is, do we there think there's other, any other I think business? There were one or two other minor items. That well, what's been kind of shelved is that lease agreement with the city of Charlestown, you know, for 661. I think that uh, everybody yes. has good intentions of honoring. Yes. Um, basically the agreed upon rental amount, which was yep. 2,418. 2, so again, we did not feel that was an item that, you know, yep. couldn't wait. Um, and there was one other item that we've been deferring, and that is the, tr the referral to the city council on the parcels for sale auction. That, yeah, that was done. Actually, we did that last. That was yeah, done. yeah, we did get that I through. Think it was so, the sheriff that ran that through the center. all right. So we can well, we can take up the the lease at the next meeting. We can also deal with the um, with the bill. So it sounds like there will at least be one more opportunity. Um, so maybe if, is it the will of the group maybe to wait until next week's meeting? to determine where you want to go with the statement. Um, I mean, that will get you past. Well, no, actually, that'll be before the workshop because the workshop will be later that evening. Um, workshop will be the same day. Same day. It'll be the mm -hmm. same day. That's right. So it's two hours after we start. Yeah. Yes. And I'll, I'll have to be remote on uh, Wednesday, but next week. I yeah. Will, I, need to, I have to be in the office. Okay. So I will not be able to be here okay. uh, in person. I can happy to join on a conference call or a phone, but okay. just let you all know. And that. again, we can defer invoices as long as on an emergency basis. And when I say emergency, I mean, for example, Potomac Edison is um, critical to get in timely for, to avoid right. penalties. So it would be an emergency signing, which we could put on the board report for the next right. the March 13th right. meeting. Right. 
So other than that, I mean, we can make that work. Yeah. Um, acknowledging that there'll, there perhaps will be one or two. Mm -hmm. I think there's a licensure renewal for one employee that would be signed. But again, we would make sure that's on the board report for the 13th. Yeah. <coughs> so if we didn't meet, I mean, that would at least give staff a chance to uh, prep for the council meeting later that evening. I mean, I know you'll be well versed anyway. <laughs> I would make a motion that we council the 20 meeting for the 27th and wait until the month of March because of what's on the agenda with the city council. Okay. And I will also thank you. That will also give these folks. If we have a meeting on the 27th, we got to leave here and get prepared for a workshop. Yeah. Let's see how they can get through the day and not end the day. All right. So a motion to not meet. Is there a second next week? Second. Let's move in second. Any additional discussion? Uh, any objections? Hearing none, we'll, uh, we'll forego next week's meeting. All right, so that means that uh, there may be an opportunity to take up the uh, Route 9 sewer project statement. So with that, I'm going to leave the room. Like I said, recuse myself from the discussion, turn it over to Pete as the uh, vice chair of the board. Okay, thank you. All right, folks. So, Jane, I guess I'll start with you guys. Um, I know we've had a lot of discussion on the Route 9 sewer project. So I guess at this point, we should go around maybe and um, kind of gauge the board's um, feelings in a positive or negative fashion on some of the pros and cons with the state financing package versus the private side. Um, I think we could do this in an open forum. Is that correct? Okay. And Kevin, you want to? Uh, I defer to, okay. to the mayor pretty easy for me. I think anytime you can get free money, you should take advantage of it. Anytime you don't have to charge ratepayers any more money, that's a way to go. So again, the bonding should be voted on and approved by the city council of Carlsbad. Along with that, if you look at the task order for number one, that deviates from a lot of things that could influence that line and who all could be using that line, which is a lot more of the customer on that. If you just do what Hatch Chester has engineered, one pump station mm -hmm. on their site, mm -hmm. that may eliminate a lot of other people being able to connect to that line in the future. Yeah, it absolutely so does. So again, I yeah. think if you do the bonding, that offers the opportunity for both throughout the north. And, and uh, so that would also, you know, given that our area of, our area of responsibility is, is out there, yeah. then we would then be required to, how do we then provide service to other pumps? But that is that's that is true. Correct? That is true. So and and go ahead, sorry. oh no, and, and that area has had significant capacity constraints for many years. So with the industrial park um, and you know it addresses this line addresses even flows that were anticipated to be incorporated in the flowing springs project. So a brief summary is if Roxel goes the 5.5 route. It's a $9 million project, and basically it's about a $2 million impact for the ratepayers. And a rough quick summary. Oh, right. yes. The other option is the other option we accept the state financing package, which is a max of what? 10.5? Yes. Okay, and that gives us the capability to upsize the project to pick up future development. In our not, area. Not 100% rock soil. Uh, Not um, even, yeah, it's, I mean, uh, rock soil is a, a small component of the small component, project. but the major thing that I don't think people realize is that also includes some improvements at the existing Burr Park sewage system, which are in dire needs or need some capacity improvements, correct? Yes, So, <clears throat> So you got option A at 9 million, you got option B at 10.5, um, the only thing I, impact. yes, they, the state money is more favorable, assuming everything runs in alignment. One, DEP grants the permit modification, which <clears throat> we still don't know where that is. So let's assume they do based on the 15,000 gallon phase one. Um, then we don't have a discussion then with Roxel for five years. Is that correct? So phase two comes up. 
or, or the possibility of the phase 1B, which again has not been, is not included in our NPDES permits, that any additional flows above 14,900 gallons Require requires a new NPDES permit. Does, does the, the line that Rock World would then send into the 5-5 or only for service control, does that only cover 15,000? Does that only cover no, the 15? Not, no, and that's actually where a lot of people are not, on, yeah, they're not, um, I guess they're seeing the request from Rock World and um, well, that, confusing that with what we're talking about now. Um, so they would want a design done for their alternate flows, which were in their, their letter to us and their request to us. Of the forty-six thousand okay, eight hundred, yes, so yes. That pipe would serve Rockwell for forty-ish five-ish number. Yes. Okay. The other thing I think is very important as we go through the discussion, which I've heard, and I respect each and every one of y'all's opinions. When you start talking about what the DEP and what the flow is going to be, what this and what that is, we're talking about a pipeline being paid for by the state of West Virginia. We're not talking about those flows. We're not talking about anything. We're talking about the pipe going in the ground at the expense of the state. And that's what the bonding's about. Mm -hmm. So you got to separate those two things. And for me, the dig the dirt, put the pipe in, is what we're talking about versus the flows and all those things after the line's in. So that's, you know, to me, it's a catch-21 to everybody if you try to connect the two. Well, I also... Mean, one equals the other, but we got to, you know... Also, the problem is if we do future expansion or... Uh, another parcel out there develops and we get a sewer request from yeah. uh, ABC is. group, whatever it might be, the actual cost for us to run a parallel line down the existing easement might exceed the initial $9 million that they put in. So you could have $18,000 worth of, I'm sorry, $18 million worth of pipe work in the ground when we were going to accomplish everything for about 10-5 all in with no impact. We heard a public comment from a lady who has been very informative to me about the $7 million project that the PSD have on the table. If Rockwell goes and does the 5.5, we may be looking at seven or more again. For that, 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 that's exactly one of the, the two yes. things that I have concerns with, it, it not going the bond route. It's how it affects the flowing streams project uh, because the, the original design was uh, curtailed that cost, saved them you know, a couple million dollars uh, and allowed it to be a, a project that wouldn't wouldn't cost as much to develop because we're going to mix the two pro programs together, the two projects together. Um, and then the other issue, if we, if the, if the council were to go 5.5 route, how does that affect and how does that come back to us with Well, if, if they decide to go, if, if they decide to, to not vote the bond, the 5.5 route would be the way it would go automatically. So let me restate that clearly. Um, if that's the way it plays out, with uh, the issues of Burr Park. What are we looking at potentially down the road and how long do you think we can last before we're gonna have to come back and talk about money spent to fix that? Do we have any idea what kind of cost that is and how that affects the rates there? Because it looks like to me, if we can't find a way to, to put that into a larger plan for the bond route, we're gonna have to deal with it at some point. Absolutely, and I think to get out of the situation that this, that this utility has been in for many, many years, line upon line and building very small lines, you know, I think we're dealing with something of the magnitude that Pete was mentioning, where you're back to building a, a line that can... Next to another line. To, next to another line, but that can, can well, deal with to the capacity. The cost, the cost really is going to be based upon the labor hours that are required to dig up the line, to dig up that, that easement area yet again. And then pump stations, <laughs> you know, pump stations, so yeah. Building, the you're basically building the parallel system because correct? Right, yes, and there's an order of magnitude of savings when you're building a project. I mean, if you compare the yeah. nine million to the 10 and a half That's million, where you have the ability to phase from a four inch line to a six inch line and then maybe use the four and the six and then use the four and the six and the eight, everything's in the ground and you're just doing it once. So right now on the on the 
another positive on accepting the state's money is that, um, I'm sorry, the utilities will be reimbursed partially for some of the engineering or at what percentage? All of it. All, All of it. it. And, and what is a, a rough number of engineering at this point? Are we over half a million dollars? One million, yes. We're at a million dollars. So, yeah. so if we don't take the state money yeah. and we have and Roxel decides to go build this thing on their own. One is we got to play by the rules. The state's going to make us prepare the cost estimates at our expense, correct? Yeah, yeah. Which has partially already been spent by the city of Lansing, which will have to be reimbursed, which will come from the Charles County Utility Board. Which is which another is issue, yeah. That's great, Dave. You know, I know everybody might not be happy who the end user is going to be, but you got to look at the way the numbers can ultimately affect the whole utility um, as a whole. That's a very well said. Thing. So I, you know. I think it's pretty clear in my opinion about what the discussion we've had and what our thoughts are. And I don't know what the state should say or do on that or Mr. Christie. But at this point, the state has not redacted anything. The offer is still on the table, correct? Correct. Details are still the same. Yes. The money still available, correct? Well, there was, words, one, there was one um, change that they did make, um, acknowledging a 25-year payback rather than the 30. I think that was for Hockey Trainer. And, you know, trying to shorten this up so uh, he would have light 20 years, I would have too, but um, we met in the middle on the 25, so that we have in writing. That and afterwards, it becomes a grant. Well, yeah, it's, no, it's no. our responsibility as a board to report back to city council with our opinion, our professional opinion, whether it's a positive or negative venture on the financing side. We have to put all the other feelings aside at this point. Vote it up or down or how they see fit. Correct? And back to Kevin's point, the effect on the Flowing Springs, we, we have that on record at the Public Service Commission in our submittals in March. March 15th of 2018, because we were specifically asked by the commission, how would this state funding impact, impact the Flowing Springs? And so we did an engineering evaluation, um, <clears throat> actually with a couple of engineering firms kind of chiming in, and we were able to pair that Flowing Springs project down by almost two million. So while, and John Kunkel has said to this board and the council that you know, we may be able to equalize rates sooner. We may be able to complete capital improvement projects without rate impacts um, in, if we were to receive the state financing package. On the other hand, if that state finding, financing isn't there, um, it, he's, he's indicated in his financial statements and, and forecasts that it will be a longer period of time to equalize rates, uh, a much higher impact, well, I won't say much, but a higher impact to ratepayers to get these three known capital projects completed. But also, it also will um, push our ability to take care of our capital improvement projects and some other projects that we have in our sewer service agreement that need work five, seven years down the road. So if we're impacted with a rate increase now and then another one in five years, it, it just doesn't make sense. Well, the other thing that's very important is that we don't take, we don't get the bonding. We still got the cost of maintaining everything. Maintenance and that right. will be another huge cost that will have. And that's the down. specific, um, that's one, one of two pieces of the 42 cent per thousand right. rate impact to all customers because we are only getting that leak, leak adjustment reimbursement, not the full 61% to O&M, to address O&M. The other we're gonna piece- be, We're gonna be short. 42 cents per thousand is the forecast right now yeah. of that impact. So it is going to make those other projects, the $2 million ransom project, the 2021 renewal and replacement, the improvements that, um, may need to occur on the Flowing Springs project and its lines. It, it just will 
take them out longer as well as rate equalization. And also we have some, I don't know the exact numbers, but there is some capacity now at Burb, but it's my understanding there's not capacity for the full build out. I need that, that needs to be clarified now that we've acquired the public well, service to, uh, district right. and we need to mesh all the- My understanding it's 1-10, which I don't know what they call that one, but there's a bottleneck even um, downstream, a, a major bottleneck at, at that bottom that you probably drive by every day. That's the one that can't take anymore. Well, the number of EDUs is available out there is about, it's probably down to nothing. So again, right? I, I want to say it'll it's be, sm maybe it'll be close small to 10. companies. It's, you right. can't come in yeah. there with a company that's going to want 10 EDUs, Absolutely 100 not. EDUs of water because you're not going to be able to get them to sewer. Capacity, but not sewer. Thank you. Any and other even questions? and then even if we were able to, you know, look at trying to complete a project on behalf of the utility with the city of Charlestown's involvement, that would allow us, you know, to parallel and put those lines in similar to what is out there to Huntfield. We we couldn't get that engineered and catch up in time, you know given the specific request from Rockwell. So you're, you're literally building or constructing potentially for one customer. And then we're, we're backlogged trying to catch up. So while we have the easement, we certainly couldn't take advantage of the open trench and, and try to get that line or three parallel lines or two more parallel lines in at the same time, because it's gonna need a rate increase. And what was the, the time frame roughly for the engineering that's on the table right now for the Lines is designed for the improvements. The it was about 15 schedule. months of um, engineering effort to crank out those drawings. Well, the drawings are approved. But um, that, so but that Ranson had started that. Oh yes, they started that back in 2017. Um, so the drawings are approved, and we're looking at an eight to nine month construction schedule. So if you if we accept the state monies and we go back to the 5.5 mandate, Roxel's going to have to start from scratch again on the engineering. So then what are we going to be obligated to a pump and haul scenario as a utility? I, I think we will have to, I, I don't, I don't know how, how they're going to deal with that. I mean, I don't know how. I wasn't going to bring that up because yeah. hopefully I mean, we don't I, get there and don't even want to talk about it. We have been I got you. Right. approaching All our right. construction deadline for a while. Any other questions from the board? Any motions, any suggestions? I do, Dick. Um, <clears throat> are they looking for a statement from us or just a simple recommendation? That's a good question for council members. Sorry. <laughs> I put you I'm on not the sure that they know one way or the other. I think it's up to us to make the recommendation to them as a board that is in charge of the utilities for everybody now. You know, they don't have to accept their recommendation, but a resolution saying that we recommend this, you know. Or even a statement in the minutes. In the, even a statement reflected in the board minutes would be what we would probably have at this point yeah. before March 4th. I understand. I, I would rather that it be before the, uh, the 27th next week so they've got it laying in front of them when they have the no, right I, I, Yeah, I think that the statement of the recommendation should, be, should come out at this meeting right now. That's right. right. Yeah, that, I, again. Right. Yeah, I would believe that. Talking about it next Wednesday evening, yeah, and I, then they're voting the following week. So I think that, and we won't have a meeting till the thirteenth. Is that correct? Right. So again, I think whatever we do, it should reflect what our thoughts are, and it should be in that form. That is my motion. <laughs> so is your motion to direct staff to prepare a statement for council? In yes. Support or in not in support. Funny coming from the state, and the reason that everything has been mentioned here is what should be included in the statement. Everybody has had an opinion and gave a reason why they feel that way. I think it should be included. I mean, it's pretty valid what we've said. I mean, again, the, you know, the end user may not be what everybody wants, but the bottom line is the reason why we're saying that it should happen that way, economically, physically, and everything needs, it, you know, the criteria calls for us, to, them, to approve the bonding. And that's all we're saying. Now, their recommendation don't mean a thing. They can vote any way they want to, Mike, but you know. But I think we would be doing injustice if we are 
the utility <coughs> board, everybody in the county now, we didn't say that economically this makes more sense. Long term plus for what we're doing now. All right, so if I understand you correctly, Pearson, we got a motion to direct staff to prepare a statement for council in support of the state, the current state financing package for the Roxville sewer, for the Route 9 sewer project. That's what it should say, not Route 9. I have a second. Second. And moved and seconded. Comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Turn the meeting back over to the chairman for approval of the bills. All right, thank you. Um, is there a motion to approve the bills? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any additional discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the bills are approved. All right, is there anything else, uh, Jane, you need to cover? No, that in, is in all. In a manager's report? Nope. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize there, I didn't have a letter. You have a letter. I we, don't, I don't, yeah, we should probably ask. Sorry, we I'm are, not. we, we just are re reporting out that out of approximately 10,000 pieces of paper that um, are being reviewed for the Freedom of Information Act request. We are sending a letter to the attorney that did the request uh, indicating they will be available for pickup on um, the 28th. Um, we're we're going to push for the 27th. But um, right now it's looking like the 28th that, that they'll be available. How many documents is it? Um, the attorneys are reviewing 10,000 document pieces of paper. It's not 10,000 documents. Yeah. So, um, so you're saying. Pages. Yeah, 10,000 pages. 10, pages. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry, just to make sure I'm clear. You're saying that you'll be responding on, you think, the February 27th? We'll respond um, by tomorrow indicating that they'll be available for pickup, you know, when, where, but gotcha. right now it's the 28th. In okay. addition, I think you received an, an additional email that was request for information and we're um, getting that response out tomorrow right. as well. Right. All right, um, anything else, any other business? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? Moved and seconded, any additional discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, we are adjourned, thanks.